Well, that's beautiful. <laughs> Great. Um, welcome everybody to the webinar. We're going to wait just a little bit longer um, for folks to keep joining. Um, my name's Elaine Kada. I'll actually start going through some of the um, uh, logistics around the call for those of you who it's your first time to Zoom. Um, Welcome. I hope you'll enjoy this platform. It's pretty easy to navigate. If you um, you are all on mute, uh, and that's just so we don't get the background noise. Um, um, and um, I want to just say, if you move your cursor down towards the bottom of your screen, what you'll see down there is um, a Q and A box. And throughout the presentation. Uh, we have an hour and 15 minutes, and, and there'll be time at the end for questions. So throughout the um, webinar, if you have a question, feel free to type it into the Q&A box, and I'll be monitoring that um, during the webinar, and uh, we'll make sure we ask your question at the end. Uh, this is being recorded, so if you have colleagues that perhaps couldn't join, there'll be a link that you receive um, a link to the YouTube recording um, that you'll receive uh, in the next day or so from Piper um, with an evaluation that we'd love for you to fill out um, and give us feedback and suggest other topics that you might want. Um, this is our last topic. This is our last webinar for this academic year. I think we had about six or seven over the course of this year. and. Um, but we're open to hearing some suggestions for future topics. Uh, again, I'm Elaine Ikeda with California Campus Compact, and um, we have been putting on this webinar series in collaboration with Campus Compact of the Mountain West and Utah Campus Compact. And um, so I'm excited today to have some California folks um, that we're featuring in this webinar on engaging immigrant communities. So um, want to, you can see their names here, and I think they're going to introduce themselves in a little more detail coming up. But um, we have Duke Austin, uh, who's an assistant professor here at Cal State East Bay in the Department of Sociology and Social Services. Diana Balgas, who's the executive director of the Transfer Student Programs uh, here at Cal State East Bay, and Andrea Wells Tully, who is the Community Engagement and Project Coordinator for the Center for Community Learning and Leadership at San Jose State University, although that's a recent move and she was here at Cal State East Bay, um, which is also where California Campus Compact is hosted. So um, we're all actually more or less on the same campus, although now we're missing Andrea, but she's moved over to San Jose State. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, any questions, type them into the Q&A box, and I'll let Duke start us off. So Duke, you have to unmute. Oh, the, the, the unmute button. <laughs> As Elaine said, my name is Duke. I am an assistant professor at Cal State East Bay. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is my class, uh, a, a community engagement class focused on immigrant communities that I created at Cal State East Bay. And uh, what I'll talk about first is, is kind of a need that I saw arising in the community, and then the response, which was the creation of the immigrant community engagement course. So what we saw in uh, 2014, this is before I had created the course, was a surge in the number of unaccompanied minors who were crossing the border into the United States. You could see this, this data came from May 2014, so not even halfway into the year, and the number of unaccompanied children who were apprehended at the border already dwarfed entire years of data from previous years. And because the U.S. Constitution uh, 
guarantees that any child in the United States, regardless of immigrant status, has, uh, will have access to education, what we started to see is that school districts were going to be impacted by a surge in, in uh, students. And this was reflected in uh, several headlines, such as this one from Edweek, surge of unaccompanied minors crossing border presents education challenges. U.S. schools gear up for surge of young immigrants. And 70,000 kids will show up alone at our border this year. What happens to them in Mother Jones? Uh, locally, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we have a couple of schools that are already serving recent immigrant populations. One of those is Oakland International High School, which uh, was featured in this uh, story by the New York Times. Oakland International High School is a school that uh, is a public school. It's a district school, so it's not a charter school. Um, and it exclusively serves recent immigrants. So every student in the school, and the school has about 425 students, is an immigrant. In 2014, Oakland International High School and its sister school in San Francisco saw a 25% increase in the number of unaccompanied minors. At that time, I had a class that I was already teaching um, called the Sociology of Immigration. And I was working with San Francisco International High School and Oakland International High School. So this class, Sociology 3612, Sociology of in Immigration, uh, had a day-long campus visit where students from one or the other high school would come for a day-long visit and form mentor groups. So each of my students would mentor three or four of the high school students. My students would take them on a campus tour, attend a college class together, eat lunch together in the cafeteria, attend an informational session on admissions to Cal State East Bay, financial aid, uh, resources that we have here on campus. And, and then my students would do in-person interviews with the high school students about their immigration experience. So my students then used those interviews to write uh, their research papers. Now this class was happening during the surge of 2014 and what some of my students and the schools themselves noticed was uh, a need for school support that the the schools needed additional additional help and so that's when i started working with the center for community engagement on the cal state east bay campus mm -hmm. i applied for and received uh, a grant to develop a new course that would follow best teaching practices that uh, would also evaluate the impact of the course on students and community partners. And so I began working on this course, developing a new course that, uh, that would place my students in the high schools themselves. So that course, this new course, Sociology 3614, Immigrant Community Engagement, uh, eventually ended up working with 12 community partners, two of those being the, the high schools I mentioned previously. Um, for this course, my students do an UndocU Ally training, which has been created by some incredible people at Cal State East Bay. Uh, my students also spend six to eight hours a week in uh, service learning. Uh, providing community service to one of those 12 community partners, all of which I forgot to say are uh, nonprofit organizations or schools that serve immigrant populations. In the class, uh, students read these two books, Learning Through Serving and Service Learning and Social Justice, and write weekly reflection papers incorporating what they read in the book and incorporating that into their service learning experience. And then we meet once a week for uh, class discussions and really going in depth about what's happening in, with their community service, service experience, how they are making an impact, how they can make a better impact, and also how the service is affecting their lives. 
We end the course with the Community Engagement Showcase, which is an evening in which uh, my students create uh, large conference-style posters. These are uh, four-foot by three-foot posters that uh, highlight their community engagement experience, tying it to the themes that they've read about in the books. To give you an idea of some of the stuff that my students do in the course, uh, this is my student in the bottom right. Uh, in the red shirt, she volunteered with Asian Health Services. Uh, here's another student of mine, she's also in the bottom right, uh, uh, providing community service with Soccer Without Borders. Here's a student in the uh, red Chicago Bulls hat, providing tutoring at, uh, at San Francisco International High School. Here's a student delivering pizza to, to hungry high school kids, also with Soccer Without Borders. Uh, other students, this is my student standing in the background, um, teaching uh, job training skills and computer skills. My student with, uh, on the right with the name tag, the orange name tag lanyard on, uh, teaching reading at Reading Partners. And uh, another student wearing the Cal State East Bay shirt, she's sitting on the left, uh, working with a high school student, uh, doing tutoring for that high school student. Other things that the, the class does, we, uh, we work on inviting community members to the Community Engagement Showcase. So we, we hope that every, uh, every community-based organization that we're working with can send a representative to the showcase. We also invite the campus community and uh, important folks on the campus. So this is, uh, these are my students. Uh, in the office of President Leroy Morishta, inviting him to attend the showcase. He unfortunately had to decline. He had a, a meeting with the governor the same night, but uh, did spend the evening, this evening, uh, meeting each student and asking them about their community service experience. The showcase that I talked about looks like this. Here my students are. Uh, standing next to their posters, fielding questions about their community engagement experience. Uh, the students really get into this and they, uh, they invite uh, their friends, they invite their family members uh, to come and uh, see them uh, talk about their community engagement experience. And, and you can tell by inviting those friends and family members that they're really proud of the work that they do. My students also, uh, give short speeches about their service. Here's one of my students uh, who was nominated, nominated and elected by our peers to, be, to give the uh, keynote address at the showcase. Uh, here's another student showing off her poster. And uh, I wanna zoom in and just show you how really the students can take this to the next level. And so this student designed her poster with, uh, with concepts that she read about in the book. I think she has those listed um, on the left and right hand side of her poster with the connecting lines to the centerpiece that talk about her particular engagement with those con uh, concepts at uh, her service site. She was at Oakland International High School. In the middle, she uh, she shows the Venn diagram of the, the three components that, that make up service learning. And so we uh, had promised that part of our, part of the class would do an evaluation. And so looking at the impact that the course had both on the community, on uh, the students, and uh, the university, uh, we, we got a lot of feedback in terms of uh, this quote from our community li liaison at Oakland International High School. He said, all of your students have had such a wonderful presence at OIHS. There could not have been a more important time in our country's history than now to be a part of it all. The students in the class, uh, almost 100% uh, say that they, the course has changed their lives. Here a student says, this course helped me find my passion. I now realize that I feel complete when I serve others. It also helped me find employment. I updated my resume with my service learning experience, and I have been offered a, posi a position as a behavioral technician. Now, interesting, 
I would say about a third of the students end up uh, being offered either part-time or full-time employment positions at the organizations where they provide service. And another third of the students have tell me things like this, that they might not have gained employment at that particular site, but just by uh, having that experience, it helped them get other employment in service-related fields. And the, the administration appreciates the course. Here, the associate provost says, you would be pleased to know how many of the students told me they are reconsidering their careers to move into school counseling or social work based on the volunteering they did as a part of your course. I don't know of many classes where students so quickly bond with ideas, possible careers, and each other within one quarter. So uh, really successful course, uh, making an impact in the community-based organizations and uh, on the students in the course themselves. Um, some folks will say, well, how do I get started? What, what do I do to, to create something like this at my university? And I would say, find your people. Find uh, the Center for Community Engagement or uh, the office on campus that's really helping reach out to community-based organizations and form those partnerships. I know Andrea Tully was uh, with our Center for Community Engagement at the time, and she was instrumental in helping me develop this course. And it wouldn't, wouldn't be what it is now if it were not for her. Cool. And that's all I have. Thanks, Duke. Um, is it Diana who goes next or Andrea? Diana. Okay. Diana, hopefully you can unmute and share your screen. Thank you. While Diane is doing that, just a reminder, if you have any questions for Duke, go ahead and type them into the Q&A. Looks good, Diana. You can go ahead and start if you want. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, listening in. Um, my name is Diana Valgus, and uh, as, as introduced, I serve as Executive Director of Transfer Student Programs, but I also serve as a Campus Liaison for Undocumented Student Resources. And so, let's see, just a little bit of history here. Our Undocumented Student Resources was developed back in March of 2000, I mean, yeah, March 30th of 2018 is when we launched um, the program. And the program primarily is virtual, which I'll, I'll, I'll cover in, in a few minutes. But I think how Duke um, ended his presentation on finding your people, um, the first slide here actually, is, is some of our people um, that have been actively supporting our undocumented students here on campus. Um, you see many of them with our GANAS uh, sweatshirts there. GANAS is a transfer program um, that um, is a learning community for transfer students. And, and GANAS is one of the first programs actually here at, on campus that intentionally began serving undocumented students. And so they definitely, um, you know, our advocates, they're definitely out there supporting our documented students, and they were out there actually tabling, informing students of the recently launched documented student resources that we have here on campus. So just to kind of preface, I think, the, the, the rest of the presentation. And so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the rising concerns which led us to um, the creation of the undocumented student resources um, virtual site. Um, responsive resources that we've been able to establish, some of the advocacy work that we um, have partake, partake in, and as well as the community of support um, that we um, frequently use and utilize, and then some tips. 
So rising concerns at the local level. So in March of 2000, of, yeah, in March of 2013, there was some conversations around Hayward. So, so our campus is situated in Hayward, California, and Hayward began having discussions about becoming a sanctuary city. And so that first picture um, on the, was actually in my left side, um, talks about, well, actually, they're celebrating the day that Hayward actually became a sanctuary city. Around the time that they were having, um, you know, community discussions, meetings around the possibility of becoming a sanctuary city, there was an increase, um, and these are some other headlines like um, Duke provided on what was happening to our city um, once Hayward decided to, to kind of explore the sanctuary city status. Um, so you see that I started coming into our city, um, a, a number of individuals, I want to say over 150 individuals have been detained. And um, so that, that caused a lot of concern, I think, for the campus, for our students who are from the area, and definitely from our um, local Hayward, um, you know, congressional leaders and, and citizens. And so Hayward is known as the heart of the Bay, which is kind of ironic, but, um, but we've, we definitely saw um, the climate change in our city and a lot of concern and worry amongst um, our faculty, staff, and students here at the university. And then in addition to that, um, at the national level, we definitely had a lot of concerns with the messaging that, you know, that um, was was taking place, um, you know, first of all, the um, September 5th decision to end DACA, and then the mixed messages, I think, that um, these tweets kind of show. On one hand, um, you know, the president had indicated um, to, to end it, but that he would support it, and do we really want to, um, you know, throw out good educated individuals, and to, the, you know, his latest post, um, saying that DACA was dead. And so if anything, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, there's a lot of anxiety, I think, amongst our students um, about their, their current status, those who have DACA and those who don't have DACA, about their future here at the university, their future here in the country. Um, we have had um, an increase in counseling needs of our students um, because of a lot of the anxiety um, we recently hosted an event um, where we invited students and, you know, many of their anxiety comes from um, returning home and their family not necessarily being there when, when they arrive. And, and so that has, you know, I think required us to respond to meeting the needs of our students, making sure that they have the care and, and support services necessary um, um, to be successful here at the university. So... So here's our responsive resources. And so as, as shared, um, we launched a documented student resources uh, program and it's a virtual, it's a virtual center right now. And it's really intended to, you know, give students access and information that they need. Our, our DocuAlly program that Duke mentioned, uh, mental health support, um, the Dream US scholarship, as well as um, statewide, the CSU resources for undocumented students. So as, as indicated, um, we launched um, the Documented Student uh, Virtual Center on, you know, in, uh, at the end of March. And it was really about to let students know that they have a place to go if they were unafraid to disclose their status, that there was a place for them to get the information that they needed to become connected with the support services um, that, that was available. And in addition to that is to find um, you know, additional support like allies here on campus. And so here's just a snapshot of our website. Um, and as, as you can see, we have given, we, we try to keep it updated with messaging, letting them know what the current climate is, what kind of support there's out there in our community to how whether or not it's completing their DACA application. Those, uh, our chancellor has been quite active in, in messaging our students and um, letting individuals know what the current climate is or what opportunities are for them. Um, we also have a directory of allies that, that's listed and the opportunity to become an ally for training. Um, and so there's a lot of other resources connecting students um, you know, to 
academic advising to financial aid to scholarships and mental health services, community resources, you know, and much more. So it's a one-stop shop for students to, to get a lot of information. So our, like, so our DocuAlly support um, was developed um, by a team of individuals here on campus. And we have over 200 allies here on campus that have been trained. They consist of faculty, staff, and students. And um, so the, that has, that's an area um, that has been growing. Uh, a lot of individuals want to become allies. I know Duke has invited the trainers to go to his class and actually have his students become allies. In his classes, we've had the provost office contact us to train all of their staff. Um, the president's cabinet all have been trained um, to be for undocu ally support. And, um, and we keep getting requests for um, departments and classes and students to, to get access to, to um, the training, but in addition to that, the status of being an ally. So here's just a, one of the um, training flyers that we, we recently uh, conducted. And so it provides a brief overview and it's really about understanding you know, immigration history at the federal and state levels, looking at policies that impact students' financial services and how to support undocumented students through their college journey. Um, it's a, it's, it runs about two hours, the tra training. And once, it, once the individual or students complete the training, they actually get um, an undocu ally placard, which they can, which can be displayed um, on their, in their office, outside their door, on the window. And it's really about letting our undocumented students find, see the symbol and know that that's a safe and welcoming space for them, that the individuals have undergone training, they understand um, what, what they're going through through, they understand, you know, the immigration history and the policies and procedures. But in addition to that, it, it is a community. And so in the event that they're not able to answer questions, there is um, leaders who, you know, understand, um, you know, the policies that are, are, are currently up to date. And so, so there is access to make referrals um, when students are having some difficulty. And our students, so since our students get trained as well, and since they don't have an office for a placard. We actually have buttons that we give them. And the buttons, basically, they either wear it on themselves or many of them pin it to their backpack. And so if students walking around campus see students with an undocu ally button, they know that that's a safe person that they can connect with. Um, featured here on, on this slide here is Melissa Cervantes. And she was um, the individual who kind of kicked off the ally training here on campus and she's recruited a number of, a couple of individuals to assist her with training because um, this is something that's not necessarily part of her job. This is something that she has passion for. And, um, and so she gets a lot of requests for docu ally training. And so by, one of the things we're looking at is actually train the trainer so that we can kind of expand the number of facilitators that we have on campus that can conduct the training. So I think that's the next phase of what we wanna do with docu ally training. And so one of the things we were fortunate enough to um, be a part of is the Dream US. And so the Dream US is a national scholarship solely for dreamers. And we had an opportunity to connect with them back in 2013. Um, that was when I was first introduced to the founder of the Dream US. And um, I actually met her in Washington DC at a conference and she just happened to ask, where are you from? I told her, California. What part? Is it the Bay Area? Do you serve community college students? Yes, I do. And, um, and, and it goes from there. Um, and so what we were able to do as a result of that conversation is we became a partner institution of the Dream US for the Bay Area. And the Dream US provides up to $25,000 in scholarships for dreamers. So it's $5,000 a year for five years. And Currently, we have, I want to say 22 scholars that have received that scholarship, and that has helped them a lot since many of our students, for sure, don't have no access to federal aid, limited access to state aid, and um, for some of them, they come from out of state. But the cost of, you know, cost of living in California is so high um, that the scholarship definitely comes in handy, you know, for, to cover tuition costs and living expenses. 
so mental health, as, as touched on a little bit earlier, um, in response to the concerns of our students um, with stress related to you know, xenophobia, racism, deportation, fear, separation of family, you know, managing finances, you know, identity, you know, um, Dr. Rene Moreno has launched um, a number of these support um, groups for students. And so, initially, so he, although students can access one-on-one -on -one counseling, um, he wanted a safe place for them to talk to each other, to be able to share kinds of experiences and concerns. And, and um, so initially he called it the Undocumented Dreamer Support Group, and he recently changed it to an immigration support group to broaden it. But it's still focused on supporting undocumented students and or those with immigration concerns. And so, so, so this is an area that um, continues to be of quite importance and more and more students are actually seeking assistance from our, our um, uh, Student Health and Counseling Services Center where um, Dr. Rene uh, is housed and um, I think that um, there, there, more students are coming out of the shadows and, and utilizing the support services to help manage the stress and anxiety that they're experiencing. So up until recently, um, the CSU did not have a center for undocumented students. And um, I wanna say it was like in June of this, I think it was April of this year, they went ahead and launched their, their website and so it serves at, as a system-wide uh, website connecting all of the, the dream centers across the state as well as virtual centers across the state in one location. And so it provides a lot of information. That's kind of the central that we go to. And when DACA was rescinded, um, they were able to leverage a lot of um, support for legal support services in particular and counseling support services. And students were able to go and renew their DACA um, through one of the nonprofits that um, were a part of the effort. And many, many times there was, they waived the, the application fee. They provided the students with legal advice and legal counseling in completing their forms. And so that's usually where the most, um, the newest news, the, the latest news is posted um, on their website. And so, and our chancellors, our chancellor actually frequently comments on, on that particular website as well. But they talk about admissions and the, and the DREAM Act and the California DREAM Act and various kinds of systems of support for them, financial aid and legal support services as well as mental health. So what are the advocacy things that we did in May of last year was launched in a documented student resource summit. And um, these were the keynote speakers. We had Sari Salamanca, uh, Antoinette Gonzalez, and Dr. Kent Wong. And um, Sari is a founder of the Dreamers Roadmap. Dr. Kent Wong is a director of the UCA, UCLA Center for Labor Research and Education. And Antoinette Gonzalez is a, is a regional um, immigration attorney. And it was a, it was a day long, um, was from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. In, in addition to the keynote speakers, we actually had concurrent sessions. And so we had a healing connection and reconciliation um, session, legal services throughout the day, um, educational resources by E4FC, and then contingency planning for our parents and legal guardians. And so in that particular session, they were able to come up with a plan in the event that they were detained, that, that they have the legal documents in place, and especially in the event that minor children uh, would be affected. And so that was something that we launched with, um, with um, some funding we were able to receive um, from the President's Council for Underserved Communities. And here's just some pictures of, of the day. And we actually got to do a um, snapshot uh, Snapchat uh, screen, so that's the one in the middle there. So people were having fun with that. And so there's, here's some other advocacy uh, work that we did. Um, in September of 2017, after um, uh, the news of DACA being sunsetted, um, 
we went ahead and really blasted the campus. We, po we, post we posted the poster all over campus so that our documented students could, could let them know that we were in support of them, that we were standing with them, and we wanted to let them be connected to the website, but also let them know all the various support services that were available to them. And we launched two campaigns. So we launched the Defend Doc as well as the Protect Dreamers campaign. And it was really about you know, promoting the, the website services and to encourage students not to be afraid and to renew their DACA. And then to you know, and urge and push Congress to pass the Dream Act. So this here is one of the activities that we did. We did, we did a lot of tabling, um, promoting the services um, to the campus community. And um, we did a lot of postcard writing. So encouraging um, our campus members and students to write postcards. And then those postcards would be sent off to congressional leaders. And so during the Protect Dreamers Advocacy Week, which is October 16th through the 20th, these were some of the sessions that we held. We did a you know, letter writing campaign with the postcards. We had a real talk protecting dreamers and their mixed status family. And we had students act, we had a student actually who was affected, who was who kind of came from a mixed status family and uh, shared her story um, when, um, when her husband was detained. Um, and then we did the support dreamers, send a postcard to Congress and then show your support on social media. So, so we sent over 300 postcards um, to congressional leaders from, from that particular campaign. And so we're going to community resources. Um, these are some of the, the community agencies that we've had the opportunity to partner with. Um, Educators for Fair Consideration is, some, is an agency that we, we frequently utilize. Centro uh, Legal de la Raza is, has been a wonderful um, regional or actually local um, nonprofit that actually has provided um, free DACA support to our students and actually physically paid for them to go on BART, escorted them to San Francisco, accepted their paperwork and mailed it on, on their behalf. So they've been a wonderful organization to us. Some of our undocumented students here participate in the Dream SF Fellowship and they actually come back to our campus and facilitate um, workshops on Know Your Rights. They've been um, journalists writing newspaper articles on behalf of undocumented students and that. So that's an organization that has been very supportive of, of our students here. You know, Catholic Char Charities and College Track. And then um, the, um, the last one there, which was the agency that um, provided all of the, the free um, uh, DACA renewal um, funding. And so for tips, and so like Duke said, um, you know, get informed. Um, so this here was something that I found. I thought this is so perfect because one of the things we talked about is definitely find your people um, is, is so important. You need to find people who are of like mind, who has similar passion. Much of the work that we do here on campus and support our undocumented students is something that we take on in addition to our regular job. It's something that is not part of our job description in any way. And so it's about the passion and um, concern that we have for our students. And so really looking at, you know, becoming informed and getting to know, you know, what the issues are, you know, safe places and or just an air to give our students, you know, that that makes a lot of differences. You know, collaborate and share information is something that we've been fortunate to, to do with, you know, Duke's class and the work that we're doing with undocumented students. And when Andrea was here, you know, we've had an opportunity to collaborate a number of things. You know, definitely keep contacting, you know, our, our, our congressional leaders to, to hopefully come up with a solution for our documented students, a permanent solution. And definitely building agency um, around, you know, the work, the work that you do and, and the people that you uh, can affect. And so with that, that is it for me. All right, turning it over to me. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, Diana, um, you have to stop sharing yours. There we go. Perfect. So, Matthew, it sounds like your cursor must be right next to the microphone. It, it, 
It probably is. I'm on a very small laptop. Okay, got it. So hopefully I won't have to use it much anymore. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Book to Action Immigration, a project we've been working on at Cal State East Bay this year. Um, some of it, you may know if you're on the call that are my colleagues. My last name used to be Andrea Wells. I'm now going by Tully at San Jose State University. And I used to be at Cal State East Bay. So that's uh, why I was working on this project. So before I even get started talking about anything else, I really have to say thank you to Cal State East Bay for supporting our Book to Action projects over the years. Um, also the Campus Compact Fund for Positive Engagement, which provided funding this academic year to really scale this initiative. Um, and none of this would be possible without the Hayward Public Library and the city of Hayward. So I really wanted to make sure I acknowledged them. So an overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, I'll talk briefly about the Book to Action program model, give a brief history of Cal State East Bay's involvement with the Book to Action program model. I'll talk about what's been going on this year with Book to Action immigration, and I'll give some tips for launching. So Brooke, the Book to Action program model, it um, has four basic parts. Um, it can be as small or as large as anyone wants it to be. Um, the first is to read a book or an article and distribute that for free, if possible, to a group. Um, then discuss the book or article with the book group or in a class. Um, attend, watch, or listen to a lecture by a subject matter expert, or watch a movie based on the book's topic to get even more informed, potentially have a conversation or a Q&A around that session, and then act by volunteering or participating in an advocacy project within the community. Um, the program model is pretty general and can be adapted to any size group, like I said. The um, toolkit is available on the California Center for the Books website. They have a very extensive toolkit for um, any topic you could really think of. We're focusing on immigration this year, but there's many topics, book suggestions, uh, advocacy and service projects, all related to books within that toolkit. And it can be found on the California Center for the Books website, and I provided a link at the bottom of the slide. So a brief history, as um, Diana and Duke know, I can go off on this history for a long time because there's many in intricacies to how we got Book to Action started on the Cal State East Bay campus, and I'll try to be brief today. Um, so this program model uh, did not start with us. Uh, the Sally, Sally Thomas, the Heward Public Librarian, um, learned about the model, I believe, in 2010 and brought it to the city of Hayward in the Hayward Public Library in 2011. It was the first book to action program launched in the state of California. And it was a, the book was Farm City and it had to do with urban farming and um, food sustainability. The California Center for the Book and the State Library got wind of the model and her success. And they took up the initiative and started offering small grants for um, people in California to launch programs with their public libraries. Since then, um, 70 plus libraries have adopted the model. Um, in 2014, Sally pitched the idea of part Cal State East Bay participating in the Hayward Book to Action program to me. And then we launched our first collaborative program in the spring of 2015. And that was a book to action music and memory project. And there's a local news article about it, Can Music Ease Alzheimer's. What we were able to provide to this effort was some funding for free books um, to community and campus members. Um, we provided access to faculty and student partners and volunteers, especially faculty who are subject matter experts and also greater participation because Cal State East Bay has a larger, um, large community and more people from the campus were involved in the effort. So from 2015 to 2017, 
Um, participation grew every year to 2017 when we confronted climate change. We had well over 2,000 people involved. Um, the number of partners involved grew, um, nonprofit and local government agencies. Financial support from the university grew. We had a new director of general education, a new dean of undergraduate studies, and with them, um, the idea of combining our campus freshman read, which was separate from Book to Action all these years, um, combining those two into one connected effort, that idea was born. And it was written into our civic action plan for Campus Compact that our president signed. Um, as I said, up until this point, the freshman read and the Book to Action efforts were separate. So fast forward to spring, summer 2017, um, deportations and, and the potential end of DACA was having an impact on our local and campus community. At the same time, the city of Hayward was creating a commitment for an inclusive, equitable, and compassionate, compassionate community. It's a mouthful. Um, they call it the commitment for short. A part of that commitment included becoming a sanctuary city and this book to action program was written into the city's plan as an action item of the commitment. That same summer, we received the Campus Compact Fund for Positive Engagement grant for our book to action immigration project. So the goals of this um, project were to enable residents to voice concerns about local and national issues related to immigration. Um, Diana mentioned that there had been some deportations in the city of Hayward, so we wanted to provide a space that people could talk about that. We also wanted to create a supportive environment for open dialogue for people that may not be advocates for immigration reform um, as well to um, voice their concerns and then also allow residents to put the city of Hayward's commitment into action. And we were, this is one of the first action items in the commitment to be launched. So what have we done for Book to Action Immigration? First, Duke kicked off the program on campus with a workshop on controversial topics, creating a positive discussion space that was right at the beginning of our um, academic year. City members were invited to attend, and some did, and he did two workshops. Then during our Make a Difference Week in fall, um, we hosted a coffee and cocoa with cops. Um, really open event on the campus. Um, and the purpose was to get our university police officers to get the word out that our campus and city police do not contact, detain, question, or arrest individuals solely on the basis of or suspected of being a person that lacks documentation. Our Pioneers for Change, which is a student leadership program on campus, spread the word about Book to Action Immigration, and also in partnership with UndocU Allies, they shared resources available on campus and invited participants to write postcards to Congress calling for immigration reform. That was a part of the Protect Dreamers project that Diana talked about. Over 250 students wrote postcards. We ran out of postcards at the event. It was very successful. And then we started taking pictures for our photo project. And our photo project really, we wanted um, allies and those being impacted with what's going on um, regarding immigration in our country to take pictures and write a message about their hopes and dreams regarding immigration, DACA, um, their future and why this impacts them. So we have well over a hundred photos, I think even more than that. Some of the photos are featured um, on this slide. And if you go to the HaywardBookToAction.org website, there's a link and you can see some of the things that our um, photo project people have said. It's very music moving. And one of the things I wanna say about this is our Senator put out a call um, asking for um, messages and what our community thought about what's going on with immigration. And we were able to send him all the pictures. Our Hayward Public Librarian was to make a statement that our um, community does support our immigrants. 
So that was our photo project. We hosted book discussions. There was four community discussions. One was led by a city council member in Spanish. And we received feedback from people who may not have been as supportive of immigration reform, but wanted to learn more about the safe space that they really appreciated having the opportunity to attend these book discussions. Um, there was an overall sense that people wanted to know more about how they could help. And then also there was numerous in-class book discussions at Cal State East Bay. Over 60 plus freshman experience courses were reading and assigned the book. So discussions took place there. Um, so then we had our community event featuring Diane Guerrero. She's an actress. Um, and if I forgot to mention, and I know it was on a slide, that her book, In the Country We Love, My Family Divided, was the book we chose this year. It tells the story of her um, parents being deported when she was young and how that influenced her entire life. Um, she came to campus. Uh, in the morning, she was able to meet with some students in a sociology class, as well as uh, students in a World House program at a local high school, which is immigrant serving and recent immigrant serving. So students in that class actually developed their own skit, Know Your Rights skit in Spanish, and they were able to perform it for her. And they participated in a panel of what um, the current immigration um, questions and worry in our country, how that's impacting them. And then, so there's a hundred people at that. And then we had two open community conversations with Diana, Diana Guerrero that had over 400 people each. Um, it was sold out and there was just a lot of people that wanted to hear her story. She was really moved to be on our campus and said that um, it was great to see that our campus is really uh, walking the talk, not just saying they wanna be advocates for the immigrant community, but trying to do things about it. So that was in February. And the next event is coming up in May, May 12th. Um, it's, gonna, it's called the Tennyson Day of Service and Community-Wide community Celebration. The Tennyson area in Hayward is underserved. So they, we're gonna get community members together with students from Cal State East Bay to um, kind of do some cleanup in the area and then participate in a community-wide celebration potluck and have a resource fair for the community about know your rights, legal aid, health services, voter registration for those who are able to vote, um, and many more things to come. A part of that is going to be a muralist who's going to be there taking input for the, from the community to incorporate a mu mural he's going to be creating um, to mark this moment that city declared, the city of Hayward declared sanctuary city status, and we want to declare that on a wall in the city of Hayward. We're also going to have our photo project um, continue at that event. And then eventually, um, once the mural design it has city member input, um, it will be a paint by number mural where community members will be able to paint a portion of the mural designed by the muralist. So with all that, that's a brief, not so brief overview of our program. Um, but I do want to give some tips for launching. So I've been, before I moved to San Jose State University, I'd been working on this project for over four years in different subjects. Um, so one of the keys is to choose a relevant and engaging book or article. One of the biggest difficulties we had last year when we were talking about climate change um, was finding a book that wasn't too apocalyptic or too science heavy, that it wouldn't be as engaging. Um, this year, since it's an actress that really resonated with the youth in our community, there was a very large interest in and also with the subject matter because of what's going on in our country. Um, I recommend people start small. So get a small group together. Don't go um, deep diving into having your entire freshman university class involved because it's a lot of logistics. Um, know your capacity and set realistic goals when you get community members together and the city and a lot of partners 
there's a lot of, we should do this, we should do that. Um, but in, at the end of the day, who is that we going to be making it all happen? So know your current capacity and set realistic goals um, for what can happen. Consult key players and involve um, subject matter experts um, is the second, another tip. Two people, Dr. Duke Austin and Diana Bulgas, were two people I involved in this initiative because they have more expertise in this area than I do. I was just, I, my expertise is involving community partners and getting everybody to work together. Um, another tip is to be agile. Things change working with community partners. We originally had hoped that the mural would be ready to paint by number at the May 12th event, and it's not gonna happen that way. So things happen, things change. Be agile, be ready, and be nimble to accommodate that. And then my final tip is to work with reliable partners. Know that these people will come through for you and um, make things happen. So it's not just one person taking on this effort. And with that, I will open it up for any questions anybody might have. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, it was great to learn more about uh, all the different aspects of how the campus is addressing these issues. Um, we, uh, so again, I encourage folks to uh, type your questions into the Q&A box that you find at the bottom. When you put your cursor down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see uh, the Q&A box. And so we have um, one question already for Duke. Um, do you have a course syllabus available that you could possibly share with folks? I'd, I'd be happy to share the syllabus. Is, uh, is there, Elaine, perhaps a way to... Uh, put it on the Campus Compact website or get it out to all participants? Um, so perhaps if you have a PDF mm -hmm. that Piper sends the evaluation out, we could attach it to the evaluation email and that way. And the other choice is if, if only a few people want it, I mean, like Joe, you could type your email address right now into either the chat or the Q&A and we could send it individually, but, um, we could also, if, if you have it in a PDF and could get it to us in the next 24 hours, then Piper could send it out on Thursday. Um, and Joe just put his email, so you could um, get that down. Um, you and Joe both get it. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I encourage, again, any questions folks have, um, while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions that come in. I'll ask a question to Duke, because it came up in your presentation that some of the students and even the Associate Vice Provost mentioned that these students were making the link to their experience onto their resumes or it influenced them getting a career. So I was just curious if you in, intentionally or explicitly, you know, in your teaching, in setting up the service learning, do you make an effort to explicitly have students think about how they could um, communicate this on their resumes, or is that just, well, anyway, do you do, you do that so students can make that connection? I, I do yeah. indeed uh, tell students that they should put this as a, a service learning experience on their resumes, and uh, we do talk about how to frame that in a way that uh, that is honest and, and looks good on the resume. You know, I feel like the course overall, it's got multiple goals. Uh, the goal that I talked about the most was serving uh, community-based organizations that are serving immigrants, um, but it also is a learning experience for the for the students and it helps them to to build those kind of job skills. So it's, it's built into the course, yes. Thank you. Um, and just a note that Joe gave you a better email. <laughs> uh, and then um, Andrea, um, um, and you might have said, I might have just missed this, but um, did you involve students in the planning of the book to action? How did you, um, or were they involved in the implementation and the different things you put on? 
Yes. So actually, I when I was at Cal State East Bay, I had the opportunity to hire two of Duke's former students. So they were knew a lot about this issue. So they started working on it. But also um, the Pioneers for Change student leaders at Cal State East Bay were involved in some of the events and supporting the event. So there was student voice in planning. Absolutely. Great, thanks. Um, so since a, since a couple of you are expressing interest in um, the uh, syllabus, we'll, we'll just have Duke send it to us as a PDF and that way we can forward it out when we send out the um, link to the evaluation and to the YouTube channel where folks can watch this video. Um, I, I don't think it'll be available to folks who are not you know, who look at the YouTube later, which is fine. I'm not sure Duke wants his syllabus out there for everyone, but definitely to anyone who registered for this webinar, you will get uh, that um, sent um, probably on Thursday. So um, any other questions? Um, let's see. Can I say one thing about Duke's class? So I just want to, shout out that this wasn't the most easy classes to get through the system. Um, two things happened. One, I um, had to work on an uh, agency agreement for a year and a half to get students to be able to serve and we found a workaround. Um, and also just getting it through the campus um, systems took a long time. And I just want to say that Duke just shows up and does the work and is undeterred. And he's really a mentor for his students. And that's why this really works for him is because he does it, he cares about it. His students get jobs because he mentors them. So it's really how he stays, shows up for the class that I really think is one of the reasons why it works so well too. That's great. And actually that raises a question for me, uh, both for Diana and Duke. Um, well, for Duke, because you're in a department, are you finding that, um, how easy it is it to find other faculty colleagues that are, are, is there an interest in other faculty coming to you to say, oh, I want to do something similar or, and then, or maybe Diane is a better person to ask, do people come up to you and talk about their interest in um, including this work into their coursework? So maybe Diana, maybe you can speak to it first and then Duke could talk about the department experience. Um, I think for, for, for me and for us, it's, it depends what, what initiative. So in the event that we're launching an initiative, especially around when the climate changes, you know, there's a lot of advocacy. People want to be involved in something. People want to support our students and, and they, you know, they, you know they, they reach out to us and say, is there anything I can do? Is there a way that I can help? You know, because they know that when you know, the tide changes, like right now, things might be a little calm, but tomorrow it may not be. And so people are responsive to the ebb and flows of, of what's happening in, in the political climate that our students are currently in. And especially, I want to say between like September and like April, you know, it was a very chaotic time period. And there was a lot of, you know, faculty members saying, you know, if you're going to form a committee, I'd like to serve on this particular committee. I serve on the Faculty Diversity and Equity Committee as a presidential appointee. And I want to say every meeting that I attend, there's always an update about undocumented students. And, and a lot of the faculty there are expressing um, some concerns about some of our students that are being featured, let's say, let's say in the, in the campus newspaper without necessarily their consent. And so, so there's, you know, policy work that's being developed as a result of, you know, the various connections, you know, between our program and faculty and Senate and, and people like Duke, you know, Duke is an awesome person to work with and he's responsive and it's, it's infectious. <laughs> yeah, so Duke, maybe you can say a little bit, <coughs> partly also about any, are you in a department that's super supportive of designing new courses like these? And, and are, is there interest from other faculty as well? Thanks. Well, first let me say thank you to Andrea and Diana. You, uh, you 
humble me and uh, I appreciate the praise. It's, it's great to work with both of you. Um, as far as my department, yeah, we, uh, it's a very supportive department and we do, uh, the chair is supportive. The chair has put a lot of, uh, effort into making this course work. And, um, and so that, that has been really helpful where I'd like to see the course grow next is, uh, building more student involvement. Currently, one of the challenges is, uh, is getting students bought into it before the course, right? They see in the, in the course catalog that they have to spend six to eight hours a week outside of class working, and a lot of students say, oh, I, that's too much for me, and, uh, and don't sign up. And uh, so I have a plan moving forward in that I'll, I'll use previous students to go speak in classes to advertise for the course. At the same time, I'm, I'm gonna repost all of the posters around, uh, around the sociology building and advertise for the course that way. Because what I'd love to see is fill the course to capacity and then uh, have to create new sections that other professors could then, then lead. Great, thank you. Do any of you have questions for each other? Uh, it looks like so far no other questions are coming out. Um, and if not, we can easily uh, close out this webinar, but just in case any of you had any questions for each other. All right, so hearing none and seeing no other questions come in, we're going to go ahead and close this webinar. Thank you all very much for the time and energy you put into doing this webinar for us. And, um, and it sounds like uh, our folks are happy and that they participated. We'll, we'll um, get the evaluation out and Duke syllabus and um, get the YouTube link out to all of you um, shortly, uh, probably on Thursday. So thank you all very much. We're going to go ahead and close the webinar, stop the recording, and exit. So.